It may seem a little strange to talk about political thought and the Jewish tradition. After all, uh, the Jews were without a state for over two millennia when the temple was destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans. The Jews were not politically independent at that time. Uh, they had political institutions, but they lived under Roman rule. And then Jews come again to have a state in 1948. So that's a long time for Jews to be basically a stateless people. And you might think that that means that they were a post-political people, that they no longer cared for problems of sovereignty, of government, that they didn't ask political questions, like Plato or Aristotle's question, what is the best form of rule? How shall we live together? They didn't worry about fundamental questions of political thought, like how can power be reconciled with justice? You might think that. And if you do think that, you'd be wrong because the Jews did think about all of these things. They just didn't get a chance to practice, to work through their thought on the level of a state. They did get a chance to work through thinking and the implications of thinking uh, within their own communities. I will say something about that. But, um, I want to suggest that my first point is that just because high politics, the politics of the state, is no longer possible for the Jews since antiquity, doesn't mean that political thought was no longer possible. They continued to have political thought. Is political thought a very important department of traditional Jewish thought? Not as much as I would like, but there's much of it there. When you look for a political tradition or political thinking in classical Jewish texts, biblical commentary, Talmud, um, it very seldom comes out and hits you in the face or wears a uniform that says political thought on it. You have to hunt for it. So, Part of how we get political thought out of the Jewish tradition is uh, by knowing what to look for, uh, by seeing, for example, in the discussion of a law in the Gemara, in the Talmud, uh, or by the discussion of a story, uh, you can see if there's political dynamics, if there are political elements within this story. Is it about exercising power? over other people in a public way? Is it about uh, how authority differs from mere power? What makes it legitimate? Why should we obey the law? Things like this. You can find this all over the place if you look for it. There are a few sources influenced by Greek thought, such as Maimonides, and we look at Maimonides today, this morning, uh, where it really is political theory with a capital P and a capital T. It, it comes out and tells you that basically this is about Seder Medini. This is about the political order. There's not a lot of that in Judaism. Nonetheless, there's political thought. Just make one more general comment about, about this. Um, there's a lot of writing today among scholars, uh, in English at least, some in Hebrew, uh, about political thought, political life, political tradition of the Jewish people. Uh, my own friend and informal teacher, we worked together, I didn't you know, study with him as a student, but there's a man named Professor Daniel Elazar, who died uh, now 19 years ago from Bar Ilan University in Israel. And Dan Elazar did more than any other person to 
think about the Jewish political tradition, wrote dozens of books about it, and try to uh, make a strong argument for a Jewish political tradition, for the content of the Jewish political tradition. People pushed back, they argued with Pelazar, they rejected his readings and their own so There's quite a, uh, I think, a dynamic situation in contemporary scholarship as to whether there's a coherent Jewish political tradition, what makes it up, where it is found. There's kind of a high view of it that yes, there is such a thing as a Jewish political tradition that has the same elements from the Bible, Ad Hayom Hazep, down to the present. That's the Elazar view. There are others, like my friend David Beale, a historian, or Michael Walzer, a political theorist. They have a much lower view. They say, yes, there's a Jewish political tradition. But what is it made up of? It's not one coherent body of thought with the same repeating patterns. Rather, it's a discussion. It's an argument among Jews. You know, Jews love to argue. It's an argument among Jews about politics. And that's what goes on, the argument itself. And what gives it any coherence or stability is that the same texts, biblical texts, they go back to all the time, but it's not like everyone's saying the same thing fundamentally. It's the conversation itself that counts. That's more my view. Um, but the only reason we're having this discussion after the Second World War is because our understanding of politics itself has changed. That is, for most of the time, at least in the Anglo-American tradition that people wrote about <coughs> political thought, if, let me say, if you don't understand what I'm saying, it's, it's not only a reshoot, it's not only permitted, but it's a khir. It's obligatory that you raise your hand and say, I don't understand what you're talking about, and I'll repeat myself until you get it. Okay. So, this is not me on Har Sinai, you know, thundering down some law. Please, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just ask, and I'll try to clarify. Um, but our understanding of politics changed. It used to be that to talk about political thought, political theory, political philosophy, it's really to talk about states, what justify the state, Everything had to do with the level of a state. That broke down in the second half of the 20th century. As the British Empire, for example, broke down and all of these new countries emerged, it became pretty clear that the political culture, the way that these countries thought about their own you know, political communities had a lot to do with their traditional beliefs. Uh, and their traditional beliefs were influenced by religion and by their own historical experiences. So our understanding of political thought now takes into consideration that people's histories, their religions, their culture, in all kinds of ways that has nothing to do with the modern state feeds into how they think about politics. So you can talk about the political tradition of uh, uh, the Yoruba, for example, in, uh, in Nigeria. You could talk about the political tradition of the Jews. And that's what, that's what we're doing. So that's a methodological change. OK. Um, so this is, of course, about modern Jewish thinking on the relationship of in Hebrew you'd say dat medina, religion and the state or religion and politics. But to get at that, I want to go back to the Bible, because everything in Judaism draws from the Bible. I want to go back to medieval thinking, Maimonides, Abravanel, uh, on religion and politics. And tomorrow, the 
assuming that we're done with Maimonides today, which may not be true, we'll see. But uh, at any rate, tomorrow we'll go to Spinoza. So I think we can consider Spinoza, if not the first modern thinker, at least kind of hinge between this prior Jewish tradition of political thought and modern Republican European political thought. Let me just say uh, regarding Spinoza, I apologize for having originally sent out uh, a text that was corrupt. I don't mean Spinoza was corrupt. By all accounts, Spinoza was a very honest and admirable person, uh, but the text itself was broken up. I didn't realize when I sent it that every other page was missing. So it's, it's not the Dead Sea Scrolls, we want it to be intact. So I found another translation of Spinoza online, and I sent that to, uh, to Vitaly last week. So I hope you've gotten that. And what we'll do tomorrow is chapter five of Spinoza's theological political treatise. Okay. Let's go back to, uh, to the Bible. Uh, so modern authors, by modern, I mean people from the uh, 16th century on have tended to read the Bible as a political text. And they think that the main message of the Bible is against monarchy. That is, the Bible is basic, if, if the Bible has a political teaching, uh, its teaching has a lot to do with warning us about monarchy, about the dangers of a king, about the dangers of the centralization of power. There's a whole tradition of European thought, uh, we'll see a little bit of it today and tomorrow, that sees the Bible primar primarily as for this more tomorrow before we get to uh, Spinoza. But just keeping with the Bible itself, we have to decide whether these modern authors who see in the Bible a critique or an anxiety, a worry about monarchy, whether they're correct. Is the Bible primarily a text that celebrates monarchy, particularly David, Solomon, his son, the monarchy of Judah that looks forward to the restoration of the monarchy in Yemot HaMashiach, in the Messianic times to come? Or is the Bible worried that a human king takes the place of the divine king? That the human king has something wrong religiously about it. I think the answer is, like much else in the Bible, both and. I think there are texts in the Bible that are very supportive of monarchy, of a very strong vision of politics. I think there are texts in the Bible that are very worried about monarchy and about a strong vision of politics and want something less structured, more fluid, more directly in touch with God, rather than having this human intermediary as a king who's given a grant of power from God. So there's something in the Bible for everybody. Uh, 
some modern authors have seen the Bible as a sort of textbook for the uh, divine right of kings. The tradition, at least in uh, Europe, that the king rules by the grace of God and the king should be as strong as possible because the king is God's favorite one. Others see in the Bible, as I said, this Republican, anti-monarchic tradition. Uh, the first text that we're going to look at <coughs> is the um, text in the Torah, in the, uh, the, the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, that talks about the king. And we'll see in a minute that this text is very ambivalent. That is, it's very um, uh, underdetermined. It doesn't say very clearly what people would like it to say. If you're a monarchist, it doesn't make the case for monarchy as strongly as a monarchist would like. If you're a Republican, an anti-monarchist, gives an opening to that, but it doesn't make that case well that strongly either. So um, does everyone have uh, the text that starts out, the translator's introduction says the <coughs> constitution of monarchy. Do you have that in front of you? Is it Deuteronomy or Samuel? Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, everyone else have? Only the electronic form. Uh, electronic form. I You don't have. Okay. I don't have, I only have my own copy. So if those of you uh, who have copies would, uh, would like to share. If, I'm going to read the whole thing out loud, so um, <clears throat> it's not fatal. But, okay, do the best you can with it. So, um, it says, if, so already this is curious that it would start with if, uh, it suggests to say if suggests something hypothetical rather than categorical, to use Kant's language, that is if. Well, if, well, maybe not if. I mean, if, if this is the case, great, but if it's not the case, well, don't worry about it. It's not you must, you know, there's no thou shalt here. It's if, ki, in Hebrew. If after you have entered the land that the Lord your God has assigned to you and taken possession of it, and settled in it, you decide, I will set a king over me, as, all, as do all the nations about me, you shall be free to set a king over yourself, one chosen by the Lord your God. All right, let's, let's think about this. This, if you're Finding this difficult in English, it's not clear, it's somewhat confusing. I suggest if you look at the Ukrainian translation of this, you probably would find it similarly difficult. Uh, because this is a difficult text, it's not <coughs> as clear as we would like it to be. So as I've always already pointed out, there's something hypothetical about it. It doesn't say, you know, lo tignov, don't steal. Lo tago, don't kill or don't murder. It says, you know, if when you enter the land and do this and that there, you should decide that you want to, you know, have a king like all the other nations, then, you know, you can do so, but God has to choose the king. That, it's just a very weird formulation. It's hypothetical, and then it says you can do something. It doesn't say you must do something. It says you can do it if you want. It implies that it's not a good idea to do it, because what we're told in the Bible again and again and again and again 
is that Jews are an amsegula, they're God's special people. They're not supposed to be like everybody else. When they are like everybody else, they get into trouble. To be an Am Kadosh or Goy Kadosh, a holy people, means a people that's separate from all the other peoples. If you act Kechol HaGoyim, like all of the other nations, like these people want to do, you lose your Kedusha, you lose your holiness. It's very problematic. So if, when you get into the land, you do all of these things, and then you should want to act like all of those nations who live around you in these little Canaanite city-states, you decide to have a king, you can do it. But then, sort of, you can't do it, because God has to choose the king. It's a difficult text. So, this opens a very big door within the later Jewish tradition for how to read this text. I think you could see that you could treat it um, in two ways. And I'll give you the, the terms, the, uh, the Hebrew terms in the discussion. Can people read Hebrew here? Yes. Yes, yeah, some little bit. Some. Okay, so there, there are two uh, ways of thinking about it. One is reshut. So this means permission. Okay, you can do it. You don't have to do it, but you can do it. And if you want to do it, there's a proper way to do it. I'll give you an example of a of a reshut in um, uh, another biblical law of permission. You might know the law. Uh, it's it's part of um, the, the context is the Israelites go to war. Okay. They're conquering a foreign city in the conquest of the land of Israel and Canaan. And a soldier finds a beautiful woman. Okay. It's not a very nice context, and it's not a very nice law, certainly it strikes us as inhumane, but within its own context, I think it's trying to humanize or moralize what is essentially a very unjust situation, certainly for the woman. But um, the soldier can take uh, the woman captive but then has to go through a process of letting the woman mourn for her family. Uh, and then uh, they have to get married, and so on and so forth. So this is not a commandment in the sense that when you conquer a city, you know, the male soldier is commanded to go find uh, you know, a, a woman. No, it's that if he is going to do that, then it has to be done in this way. Okay, so that's an example uh, of not a commandment as such, but regulating, controlling something that someone uh, has permission to do under the circumstances. As I say, it's, a, it's what I would call an ugly law uh, for an ugly situation. Uh, but with its own context, it tries to humanize this ugly situation. Uh, another uh, thing we might have here is a, a mitzvah, which is a, a straightforward commandment. So that's the question that kind of enters the Jewish legal tradition, the tradition of political thought. Is this text, Som Tasim Alecha Melech, you shall set a king upon uh, yourselves, merely the permission to do so as the hypothetical form of the statement could be read to imply? Or is it a commandment in that when you get into the land, this is what you should do? Appoint a king. 
because you can't have a proper political community, a state. You can't have real politics unless you have a king, unless the politics is strong and has cohesion and continuity. There should be a dynasty. There should be a centralization of power, all of this. So the text poses a question. And the Jewish tradition tries to answer the question. It doesn't succeed in answering the question. Uh, there is no coherent teaching. Some of the people we'll look at are very strong monarchists, like Maimonides, and others are anti-monarchical, uh, such as the Prophet now. Clear so far? Any mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. yes, in general. In general. Anything? I mean, I'm speaking because these states are difficult. <coughs> they are difficult. Anything in particular that I can make more clear? And may I ask a question? Please. The, the sentence begins that when you come into a land, but it uh, doesn't uh, have any information about if the Jews do not come into the other land. They can stay in Israel, and so there is another situation. But there is the beginning, like I said, when you come into the land. Well, this is the choice that, which you are talking about, but maybe Jews do not come into other lands. You know what I mean? Yeah, so the <laughs> word Haaretz, the land, in the yeah. Deuteronomy text, that's clearly Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, or uh -huh. Eretz Kanaan. Uh, can, could the Jews have a king outside of the land? I don't think the Bible envisions that scenario. I don't think it sees that as a, as a possibility. I would say, in general, given Jewish history, and the fact that for most of Jewish history, Jews did not have full power or sovereignty over their own common lives, most real political thought in Judaism takes place not in the Bible, but in subsequent Jewish experience, particularly in Europe, where you have these Jewish communities that for centuries could control their own affairs. This was called, if you've studied European Jewish history, this is called the Kihilah, Kihilot. This is the self-governing Jewish community that you would find uh, in Ashkenaz. And that's really where Jews thought a lot about issues like taxation, redistribution of wealth, equality, voting, obligation to rulers, why rulers, why rule is legitimate, why not anarchy, kind of basic political questions. That all, it mostly takes place outside of the, the land of Israel and after any kind of, of king, kingship. So if you look at uh, books that write on Jewish political thought, of course, they have to start with the Bible, but the biblical experience is really not that relevant to subsequent Jewish life, particularly Jewish life today. Um, so in that sense, I think I can answer your question, but the, the possibility of a melech, of a king, outside the land of Israel is not. Okay, so um, I shouldn't move around for you again. <laughs> I'll sit down. <laughs> it's, I always like to, when I teach to move around because it makes me feel more awake to get livelier. But maybe that's no good because if I move around to get livelier, I speak faster. <laughs> so I'll just go back to my semi jet lagged state here. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, the, next, the next text. Uh, this is requesting a king. This is 1 Samuel 8. 
By the way, the book that I got this from, there's a, a three-volume series published by Yale University Press called The Jewish Political Tradition. That is a collection of hundreds of texts with commentaries about all of these matters. So this is the biggest uh, modern attempt to try to make sense of Jewish teaching on, on politics. It would be a very good collection for you to have uh, in your library. Okay. Uh, so here we're out of the Torah portion of the Tanakh, and we're into the, the the, the Nach part, the, the prophets, the Vim. And uh, as you know, the first books of the prophets, not really prophets as we later think of them as Isaiah or Jeremiah, they're books of history. And uh, it, it starts with Joshua, Judges, and then Samuel divided into two books, and then Malachim, Kings divided into, into two books. And then we get into the so-called literary prophets like Isaiah and so on. But the, those first books after Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, uh, into Samuel, they have uh, just a lot of political content to them. I mean, the teaching of the book of Joshua is very much how do we get from the charismatic leader, Moses, to someone who's not charismatic, someone who has some of Moses' genius, some of Moses' you know, direct encounter with God, but is clearly a secondary figure. How does Israel organize itself after the kind of uh, closeness to God in the formative period before entering the land? How does Israel begin to dwell in the land? So first the book of Joshua. The word I used, which is a, a good word to know, charisma, or as an adjective, uh, charismatic. What is, does anyone know what charisma means? It's very similar to it. Charisma. Yeah, it's a Greek word, so I think we're going to Russian, Ukrainian. Well, the special gift, usually from a divine source, a kind of power. And you know the, um, you know the, um, the very important um, 20th century thinker, Max Weber. So Max Weber, uh, early 20th century German social theorist, economist, sociologist, if not one word to describe Max Weber, is still a sort of saint among social philosophers. Max, Max Weber was the one who talked about Charismatic authority, traditional authority, and finally, bureaucratic authority. So for Max Weber, political authority usually begins with the shaman, with the god king, with, um, with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, with Moses some figure deriving authority from a, a religious, ultimate, absolute source. And what politics does is it matures, is it tries to turn charismatic authority, which is only one special person like Moses, to kind of regularize that and to make it traditional to make it something that can be inherited, can be regularized, can be um, authoritative without the 
tied to God or to a higher power, something like that. So Joshua, the book of Joshua is, in a way, taking that political problem seriously. When we get to Shoftim, to the book of Judges, um, what you have, if you've, if you've read the book or know anything about it, is these constant bursts of charismatic authority. The Shoftim, or judges, are not judges in the sense of like a British court with a guy in a wig and black robe sitting on a bench. It's not a, it's their warriors. They're, they're, they're warriors who are kind of given a power by God to come up, fight the Philistines, do whatever needs to be done in the moment. And when the people say, for example, to the judge Gidon, Gideon, uh, when he says, uh, you know, this is a good idea, you should be our king, and Gideon says, no, you know, I, I, that would take God's place if I were your king. It's a very anti-monarchic tradition. So the book of Judges is always struggling with, there's something really good about these Shoftim and their charisma and their authority, and people follow them voluntarily, and they win military battles, and then they settle down again. That's, that's good, so they have a lot of freedom. They can govern themselves in their cities and towns with their elders who do justice and bring justice in the gates of the town and so on. That's a kind of utopia in the sense of a free people settled in its land, living without strong, top-heavy government. On the other hand, it's a disaster. Uh, they're constantly being conquered by the, uh, the, the Canaanites, the Philistines. Uh, there's no stability. Uh, the book of Judges ends with this you know, uh, catastrophe of the tribes fighting each other. It's a real mess. So the book of Judges both celebrates liberty and condemns it at the same time. And the refrain seems to be, only a king is going to make this right. So that's the larger context. And then Samuel comes along. And uh, Samuel has a kind of miraculous birth. So there's a charisma there. And Samuel is the last of the judges. And he governs Israel well. But his children are not very good. Uh, maybe he spent too much time governing and not enough time parenting. I don't know, but his children are corrupt. They take bribes. They don't dispense justice fairly. They don't, they're not good judges. So the people come to them. Uh, you can see in the bottom of page 120 here. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and his second son's name was Abijah. They sat as judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not follow in his ways. They were bent on gain. They accepted bribes. They subverted justice. They were corrupt. So what do you do? How do you bring about good politics, justice? There's this institution, we don't know much about them. It's in Hebrew called zakenim, elders, zaken, old. Uh, we don't know much about these elders. They seem to be an old form of local rule. And sometimes they get together and they sort of represent the whole people, the edah, the entire community of Israel, considered from a public or political standpoint. The Bible uses the term Eida in this way. Ayin Dalet Hey. Um, here the Zikainim seem to have a political function. They're not just the old guys who know the law who sit in the gate of the town and you bring your case to them. But they come together and they um, make a plea on behalf of Kol Adat Yisrael, the whole Israelite people, to Samuel. All the elders of Israel assembled and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You have grown old, 
and your sons have not followed your ways. Therefore, appoint a king for us to govern us like all other nations. So this is quoting the Deuteronomy text, uh, presumably given to Moses by God. You know. Samuel was displeased that they said, give us a king to govern us. He doesn't know what to do. He's upset about this. He has uh, negative or perhaps conflicting feelings. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord replied to Samuel, Heed the demand of the people in everything they say to you, for it is not you that they have rejected. It is me they have rejected as their king, like everything else they've ever done since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me. God is upset. I would use uh, some other English words, but it's being recorded, so I'll behave. Um, you can see how this, a text like this gives a lot of support to the Republican, anti-monarchical side of the argument. And this is the text that some of those early modern political thinkers have kind of jumped on. Um, and uh, it's also important to Spinoza. More about that tomorrow. Okay, so uh, God, who gives the Torah, who gives permission, or perhaps a command, to appoint a king, is now upset that the people are actually going to do this. So this text also presents a big problem. How should this be read? Well, let's read a little bit more of it, and then we can interpret it. Uh, so God places this within a history of uh, rejection by the Israelites of God. They forsake God, they worship other gods, they've been doing this for a long time, and now Samuel, you're getting a taste of what they do to me, they're doing to you. Heed their demand, that is, pay attention to it, give, give in to it, but warn them solemnly, you know, make it very clear to them of what the practices of any king who will rule over them will be. Um, so the people who want a king will be allowed to have a king, but God tells them they have to go into it with their eyes open. That is, they get to choose some degree or other, to some extent, they get to choose who their king will be. That's their reshut. But they have to be well informed. So you could say that an important part of Jewish political thought is consent. You can't have can't have legitimate political rule if it's imposed. It can't just be dropped on top of you like a mountain. You have to agree to it. You have to have uh, some participation in the decision. But people know this word consent. Somebody who's good in English translate this into Ukrainian Russian. Oh, this Agreement, согласие. Okay. Согласие? Согласие. Okay. That's in Russian. I remember when I, I took Russian for a few years, uh, but the согласие was like, I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, so that's, that's the idea. Um, now, in any good contemporary politics, like a contemporary democracy, this is part of the story that we tell ourselves, right? That we have consented, we have agreed on some level to be part of the social contract that gives the, that establishes the state and gives the state legitimacy. If we're simply a conquered people and we have no choice in the matter, if it's imposed on us, the state lacks legitimacy. 
to that extent. We feel that we're in an inner exile from the state. If we've chosen the state, if we see goodness in it, even if we don't found it, but we participate in it in a willing, affirmative way because it gives us benefits that make life worthwhile, then there's consent. So the Bible's political teaching has a lot to do with consent. It has a lot to do with the idea of, of, of a covenant in Hebrew Brit, this grand agreement between God and the people of Israel. And this is part of why modern political interpreters of Judaism or modern interpreters of Jewish political thought find very attractive about the Jewish political tradition. There's a lot of the consent in there, and you can see that uh, you can see that right here that the people need to be told what they're what they're asking for. And if they still want to do it after this hatra'a, this warning, uh, then then the, the politics, the monarchy, uh, will have uh, legitimacy. Uh, they can't, it can't just be imposed on them. So what does Samuel say? The term that's used here is mishpat ha-melech. You might translate it as the law of the king, but it really means the practices of the king, the practices in a kind of legitimate official sense, what the king is entitled to do. So what is the king entitled to do? How will the king legitimately infringe on the present liberty of the Israelites? The Israelites are going to give up liberty to enter into the political state of monarchy. Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this will be the practice, mishpat, of the king who will rule over you. He will take your sons and appoint them as his charioteers and horsemen, and they will serve as outrunners for his chariots. He will appoint them as chiefs of thousands and of fifties. So there's going to be now this bureaucratically organized corvée labor society where the king is going to own a lot of land and people are going to have to work on it and with chariots there's going to be a standing army not just a judge comes up you need an army people come together you go it's the whole society is going to be reorganized here uh, from the top down so it's not just you know your son's going to go here ride on a horse so that's fun he doesn't like to ride on this. No. There's a sweeping reorganization of society here. This fundamental change in the uh, political culture and organization of this uh, society. Uh, they'll have to plow his fields, reap his harvest, make his weapons. He will take your daughters as perfumers, cooks, bakers. He will seize your choice fields, vineyards, olive groves, give them to his courtiers. Courtiers are the people around the king, the inner circle, the retainers. So now, suddenly, there's this whole new society that's going to come into being of kind of aristocrats who get their power from the central source of power. It's going to be a much more of a class-based society. Very dramatic changes. Uh, the king is going to take a tenth part of your grain, a tithe, we say in English, ma'aser, in Hebrew, grain and your grapes, he's going to give them to eunuchs, eunuchs, there's going to be now a harem, so you need eunuchs for the harem. He will take your male and female slaves, uh, so it's just, you can see how this is going to say, he will take a tenth part of your flocks, you shall become his avadim, his slaves. The day will come when you cry out because of the king whom you yourselves have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people would not listen to Samuel's warning. No, they said, we must have a king over us. 
that we may be like all the other nations. Let our king rule over us and go out at our head and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the king said, he reported it to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed their demands and appoint a king for them. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, all of you go home. So, um, it, the narrative is a little bit like what happens at Mount Sinai, where uh, the people don't want to hear from God directly because God is too terrifying, too powerful. Moses going up and down. Uh, and the people ultimately say, you know, not a seven ishma, we will do this, we will hearken to this, we will obey everything that God has said we will do. But God also asks for their consent to enter into the covenant. So this is a kind of covenantal moment uh, to which the people uh, agree. So the people must be in very desperate circumstances to agree to this tremendous uh, change in their social order, this tremendous infringement on their liberty. Yes? Well, it's more of a historical question. Do you think that this is describing the situation before, like before the day came, or that they already had a king and then they was post octum like writing the... They, it seems like they are very well aware, or Samuel understands a lot about what will be the practice of the kings, does it come from the experience seeing like other kings? Or yeah. is it historically that they already had a monarchy and they had a king and then afterwards they wrote this text? What do you think? Well, I don't know um, the, uh, the redaction history, to use a technical term, the history of the editing of Shmuel, of these books of Samuel. I think that in general, the historical books of the Bible show uh, a good deal of um, uh, the impact of the Davidic kingship. That is, they're, they're edited under the, you know, the scribes and the intellectual circles that surround the Davidic court. But if this material didn't have authenticity, if it didn't have, if it didn't represent a tradition that the biblical editors thought was holy and pure and true, it wouldn't have survived. That is, it would be much more convenient for the Davidic circles to have just stamped this out and suppressed it and censored it because it's not complementary to kingship. But the fact that it survives, I think, suggests that it represents authentic Israelite thinking from before the monarchy. And what they're looking at is the practice of monarchs in Egypt and Mesopotamia, in Hatti, you know, in the, in the other empires and city-states that they can observe. And that's what comes with being kechol ha-goyim, like all of the other nations. This is what they do, so this is what's going to happen to you. Chris, one ir very ironic difference is that all the other nations don't choose their kings. I mean, that's not how it works. <laughs> so there's some sort of peculiar hybrid here of the Israelite covenantal consensual mentality that it's about choice. It's about entering into a kind of mutual relationship with a ruler who's going to protect you, and in exchange, you'll give up some of your liberty for that protection. It's part of the constitutional thinking of the, of the Bible. Um, okay. Well, you know, so what happens? Where does, I, I didn't take any more of the book of uh, Samuel here, but who, who gets to be appointed as the first king? Does anyone remember? Sure. Yeah, Shaul, Saul. And, uh, the people agree that they want a king, but they don't actually get to choose the king. That is, God chooses Shaul, and God makes a mistake. I mean, God <laughs> says to Samuel, you know, go to this guy, Shaul, Saul, and anoint him. 
And it turns out to be a disaster. Um, because Stoll doesn't know how to do it. I mean, he's the first one, so it's uh, understandable that he can't quite get it right. I mean, there's not a model, at least there's not a good Israelite model for him to, to do this. And Saul becomes a very tragic figure. Uh, it's always seemed to me, for doing the right thing, but for doing something that, <clears throat> that displeases God. Um, so one of the interpretations of the Deuteronomy text that we read is that uh, the Israelites are commanded to choose a king, not just permitted, but ultimately they don't make the choice. God makes the choice, and the Israelites have to agree to the choice. Another explanation is that there's no uh, need for them to choose at all, and there's no need for God to appoint, uh, appoint a king. I, so to do that, let's look at the uh, Isaac of Ravenel um, text. I'm going to skip over Maimonides for the moment and go right to Abravanel. I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's in the same uh, group of uh, texts uh, copied from the Jewish political tradition by Michael Walzer. It says, Republican and Theocratic Critiques, Isaac Abravanel, Commentary on the Pentateuch. And this is Abravanel's commentary on Deuteronomy 17. 14. Abravanel is a historical figure. His dates are uh, 1437 to 1508. Isaac Abravanel uh, was born in Portugal. He served uh, the monarchs of Portugal and later of Spain uh, in an official capacity as a treasurer, uh, as an advisor. He fought to prevent the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. Unfortunately, he lost that uh, argument with Ferdinand and Isabella whose court preacher, Torquemada, won the argument, the Jews were expelled, but Abravanel had more experience of high politics, of being a statesman, than any other late medieval Jew. And Abravanel is the most skeptical of politics of all of the medieval Jewish commentators. He knew what life at the top was like. He, uh, after uh, his exile from Spain and Portugal, he uh, settled in Venice, and he also uh, worked for the rulers of, uh, of Venice. He wrote his huge Torah commentary. It's, uh, it's a great, extremely interesting commentary. It's very scholastic. It's sort of organized like medieval Latin scholarship of questions and answers. It's kind of systematic, but uh, he goes on forever. It's, he's very long um, But uh, Abravanel is very impressed by Venice and also by Florence, which are republics, not monarchies. And he thinks that, re that to be organized as a republic with a free city or free state, that elects its rulers into a, a small committee, and those rulers share power, and they cycle on and off, and there are frequent elections, and it's a res publica. People have a commonwealth. They hold power together and delegate power to leaders. He thinks that's far, far better than a monarchy. So what he does in this reading here is he interprets Deuteronomy 
17 as a republican text, not a monarchical text, and he uses both empirical evidence, look how much better Venice is run than Spain, what do you need a monarchy for, but he also uses a more philosophical argument. Um, he looks at why people advocate for monarchy, what they think monarchy brings them, continuity, stability, clarity, there's one central source of power and order, it's not spread out into conflicting you know, persons or groups, it's better, monarchy is better. He shows why that's not, why that's not the case. Uh, it's a very interesting text, I don't think we have time to, to really pull into it, but uh, just to, to go over some highlights of it, uh, he says, first we should establish whether a king is a necessity, indispensable for a nation, or is he rather superfluous? He says, you, don't, you don't need a king at all. The philosophers have considered him necessary. Well, who are these philosophers? Um, he doesn't tell us, but um, my guess is that the Muslim political tradition on which some medieval Jews, particularly Maimonides, draws <coughs> from. The, so they, they go back to Plato. You know, Plato wrote several books about politics. The most influential is the one we translate in English as The Republic. I don't know what the, the translation is in Slavic languages. Uh, um, and he also wrote a book, his last book, that doesn't have Socrates in it, called The Laws. So the Republic doesn't have monarchy. The Laws, however, uh, particularly the tenth book of this, this book, The Laws, no more. The Laws has a charismatic figure who's kind of a prophet, who understands that law ultimately comes from the absolute, from the good. It brings the form of the good down to human society. And what the Muslims do, a thinker like Al-Farabi, who's a primary Muslim political thinker, is he takes Plato's laws and he Islamicizes it. He sees Muhammad as the charismatic political leader who takes the laws from God and has the imagination and the intellect and the ability as a prophet to apply them to human society and to create the ultimate good society that has divine law. So he's not a king, but he's sort of like a prophet slash monarch. Maimonides does that with Moses. I think that's what that's the tradition that Bravanel is rejecting here. So, <coughs> bless him. So on the one hand, we have a, a very strong version of a kind of holy, super religious politics underwritten by God with a lot of help from Plato. On the other hand, we have a Bravanel's republicanism wanting to argue with the philosophers and saying, yeah, you, don't need, you don't need any of that. I think one difference historically here is that Maimonides, Al-Farabi, Muslim thinkers and Jewish thinkers in the Muslim world through some accidents of history, they don't have a full text of Aristotle. They have the ethics, they have the metaphysics, they have the organon, the logic, they have other things. They don't have the politics. And if you have Aristotle's politics, which is very different from Plato's political writings, then you have much more foundation for republicanism. Uh, even for democracy, although it's, it's not a good form of politics for Aristotle. But you have something more like a middle class, sort of down-to-earth, you know, 
we can figure it out together and seek our good together kind of politics. You don't need Plato's laws, you don't need the divine, you don't need prophets, you don't need Plato's utopianism. Aristotle thinks Plato's utopian state is, is crazy. Uh, so, unfortunately, the Muslims don't have that, and the Jews in the Islamic hate world don't have that. But uh, Bravanel is living in the Christian world. <clears throat> So he has a broader tradition to, to understand. Um, so he argues against these three things that monarchy is supposed to provide. Unified power, not shared, permanence, absence of change, and absolute power. But he thinks all of this is wrong. And uh, the text gives us his, his argument. He says, why? at the bottom of the, the page. Finally, why cannot their powers be limited and determined by divine laws or human nomoi laws? Reason suggests that in a dispute between the one and the many, the many should be heeded. You know, if you have a lot of people, or at least a group of you know, the best people who've been elected for the purpose, their collective thinking might be more intelligent, more rational, more powerful than one person's thinking. Because collectively, you know, they've discussed it. They have shaklavataria. They negotiate it. They come to a better judgment, not just some crazy thing that you blast out on Twitter at 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, so, all this shows, he says, toward the bottom of the next page, that a king is not necessary for a people, as is claimed by Maimonides. It is astonishing that the adherents of this false view liken the unity of the king derived from popular consent to the unity of the eternal, necessary, blessed first cause. So he's saying that part of the argument in favor of monarchy is just as you need uh, a first cause for the universe to get started uh, in answer to the metaphysical question, why is there something rather than nothing? You needed some agent beyond any something bring something into being, some powerful cause that can be the cause of causes, as these medievals believed. So you need some powerful single organizing principle to bring a political community into being. Abravanel says, this is heresy. This is Avodah Zarah. This is, this is like idolatry. You're making idolatry by comparing a human figure to the king. Okay. So that's a strong point. I'll say two things about it, and then we'll wrap up for the, for the day. Um, given God, given a Torah, given a divine connection to charismatic human beings, given the need for a politics, for some sort of political organization of society in a non-utopian world, there are two different ways you could put this together. One is the view that Bravanel is rejecting and that Maimonides is something like endorsing. And that is the power of God, the uniqueness of God, the centrality of God, the sort of radicality of the divine principle. That has to carry over into politics and you need a human ruler who's like that. But the way to have a politics under God is to have the king be like God. That's the implication of the divine for human beings. Let's emulate that. Let's imitate that. Let's have that kind of power pyramid. Just as God stands at the beginning and the top of creation, so the king stands like the top of a pyramid at the beginning of the, of the, the human social order in politics. And there's, there's that strand in the Bible. Psalm 2 talks about the king as Ben Elohim, the Son of God. In the Bible, I think that's a metaphor. For Christianity, that's like literally true. 
Christ is the, is the Son of God, one of the persons of the Trinity. That's one way of doing it. The other way, which I think is the majority way, I think Abravanel goes a little too far with his plea for republicanism, it distorts the text too much, but Abravanel's view is no. The way to take account of the divine as the Lord of all is not to replicate that in human terms, it's ikam to mistabra, just the opposite. The way you do it is to have a human polity that's not all powerful that's fully consensual, that diffuses power, that doesn't look anything like a centralized, absolute monarchy, that's constitutional, that the power has to be responsible to a higher law, that law is the Torah, and that you basically think of power, of politics, as completely human, not doing the will of the divine in any direct way, but answerable to the people. In other words, politics is secular. And there is a strong medieval tradition on which Abravanel's view is based that goes back two centuries before him. I'll say that more, more about that tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll start with Maimonides, some of the intricacies of the medieval tradition, and then we'll get right into Spinoza. Uh, yeah. Okay, I hope this was down to earth enough so that everyone was able to follow along and um, it wasn't uh, I guess it can still be clear but it can also be boring so I hope it was <laughs> clear and non-boring at the same time thank you